All right. Well, last time I got started, and I made various distinctions, and later on we'll challenge those in various respects. Uh, but the basic idea I want you to see is that there is a broad distinction in the study of the philosophy of language, roughly speaking, between what you might call a formalist strand that emphasizes uh, the, uh, uh, the formal mathematical logical structure of language and adherents of that view tend to see ordinary languages as essentially degenerate forms of uh, ideal formal languages such as the predicate calculus. And they uh, tend to use a lot of formal apparatus. Uh, nowadays, it's very fashionable to use something called possible worlds semantics, and I'll tell you about that later on. There is another strand, uh, which I think is uh, uh, the more powerful strand, uh, which emphasizes that language is above all a human social phenomenon, uh, that people get busy and talk to each other, and that is ultimately what we're interested in studying, is the use of language to perform speech acts. That in a broad sense, uh, the study of language is part of the study of the mind. Now, uh, I am an adherent of the second strand. I think uh, you don't understand the formal logical apparatus unless you see it uh, not as a branch of mathematics, but as a, look, as a f way of structuring uh, human intentional behavior. However, I have to tell you that right now, at this stage in history, much the most influential strand in the philosophy of language is the, what I've been calling the formal strand. And by the way, these are my uh, labels. I, I don't know that the people in question would label themselves that way, but you'll get a feel for the difference when we get into the subject more. Now, I'm not sure how to organize the course, but the way I'm going to do it is to tell you first how I think the study of language ought to be done and how I've been doing it for the past 50 years or so. And then I'll uh, to, then I'll go back and we'll start with Frege and Russell and pick up the various issues and conflicts uh, between these two strands. However, it's not like the philosophy of mind where I think that the guys I'm opposed are basically just hopelessly wrong. Behaviorism and dualism and computationalism and all that. Uh, whatever else we may say about the formalist uh, guys, they have something to say. There's some uh, very important insights to be got from that. It's just I think that the insights you derive from the uh, formal study are based on a much deeper conception of language, which is language as above all a human intentional activity. And that's what I'm going to try to get across. Okay, now the reading, well, we couldn't get a hold of Austin, but maybe that's... Um, a blessing in disguise because instead of working through his whole book, just read that article uh, in Al and Al Martinich's book. Um, Al's real name is Aloysius, and I think that's kind of cruelty to children. I, I'd hate to, you know, I'd hate to go through second grade being named Aloysius. Anyway, he's a great guy, and he calls himself Al, uh, and he publishes the best book the best collection of readings on the philosophy of language. It's a humongous thing, and I haven't read all that crap in it, so I'm not going to. And I have a principle. I won't ask you guys to read anything that I won't read myself, okay? So I will. The stuff I'll assign, I'm either going to read or have read. So read Austin's um, I, a, a piece in there on performative utterances. All right, now last time, I blithely introduced some of the most contentious issues in the philosophy of language about the distinction between analytic and synthetic and necessary and contingent and, and a, uh, I always get them backwards, uh, a priori and a posteriori. And you're going to hear about, about them later. And then I also introduce distinctions between speaker meaning and sentence meaning. And I'm going to argue that speaker meaning is primary. A lot of people think no, sentence meaning is primary. There's a distinction between syntax and semantics, and that's going to be uh, crucial. And uh, with that distinction, the distinction between syntax, semantics, and pragmatics, between the form, the meaning, and the use of language. Uh, and then, in connection with that, I introduced two crucial notions, the notion of compositionality 
and generativity. And it is a remarkable feature of human languages and is certainly not possessed uh, by uh, all animal communication systems that they have both of these features. You can tell what the sentence means just by knowing the meanings of the parts and how they are arranged in the syntax. And furthermore, given that you understand the syntax, you can generate an, a, an infinite number of new sentences, sentences that nobody ever heard before. And I gave you one or two ridiculous examples, and I can't even remember them, but you can, for fun, uh, just to annoy your friends, uh, generate a whole lot of sentences that they hope they would never have heard and never want to hear again. Uh, but anyway, those are remarkable features. You can shuffle words around at will. And as I said, I have the greatest admiration for my dog's intelligence, but he, he can't do that. He can think there's somebody at the door, uh, but he can't think, I wish there were a thousand people at the door. Or God knows how many people will be at the door next week because there were too many people at the door last week. Uh, he can't think any of those thoughts. Uh, he can't even think how much fun it would be to visit the zoo next Sunday because there are a lot of funny looking animals in the zoo that he could bark at. So there are all these crazy things that humans can do with language that animals can't do. Uh, and later on, I guess we have to talk about some of the animal languages because an, an enormous amount of, of uh, uh, play, an enormous amount of philosophical mileage is made out of the B language and the uh, various uh, uh, efforts to communicate by dolphins and whales and all the rest of it. And I take that seriously. I think we ought to reflect seriously on that. And then there's that damn parrot. We ought to think about uh, the parrot because people whose opinions I respect think the parrot actually, in some sense, can sort of talk and understand. Well, okay, we'll get into that. But right now we're with human beings and their remarkable capacities. Now there's one distinction I forgot to introduce, I just forgot it, but you have to, you're gonna hear more about it later. And it's the beginning, it's in every logic textbook, and it's the distinction between use and mention. And clearly we need such a distinction. It's just the way that it's described in the textbooks is just, I think, absurdly wrong. But anyway, here's how it goes. I'll take an example from Quine. If I say Boston is in Massachusetts, I'll abbreviate it, that's a statement about Boston. If I say Boston, with quotes around it, has six letters, that's a statement about the word Boston. This is a case of using the word Boston, and this is a case of mentioning the word Boston. So far, so good. But now comes the absolutely amazing view, invented by no less a person than Frege, and as far as I know, repeated in every logic textbook since, that says, <coughs> here the proper name of a city occurs. Here, that name doesn't occur at all. Rather, there's a completely new name, I'll draw a circle around it, and that name is the name of a word. So, in the first sentence, the word Boston occurs, but in the second sentence, the word Boston doesn't occur at all. The proper name of the word occurs. Uh, furthermore, uh, if you think that Boston occurred, the word Boston occurred in this sentence, that would be like thinking that the word cat occurs in the word catastrophe. The word catastrophe isn't about cats, and it hasn't got the word cat in it. It has a sequence of letters, but the word cat does not occur in the word catastrophe, Sim no more than the word Boston occurs in number two. Well, what does occur? Well, we can name what occurs with three, and that is we, we can say, well, uh, uh, we can say this one occurs in two, in proposition two over here. That is, you can keep going up with names of names of names of names. Now, 
I, this always seemed to me incredible. It seems to me the word Boston obviously occurs here, and we put quotes around it to indicate that it's being used and not mentioned. However, I, and I think that's an egregious mistake, and it's one reason I never made it through a logic uh, a textbook. I always got stuck on about page one, and, if I thought, I, and I thought if they say outrageously false things on page one, God knows what's going to happen later on. Um, uh, anyhow, uh, the first book on logic I ever read was one I wrote. Uh, and uh, well, that was with the help of a guy who actually knows something about it. Uh, and uh, most of my friends uh, tell me it's a dreadful book. But anyway, I, I leave you, that you can decide uh, for yourself. But anyway, I think that this, the, just to summarize this part, there is a, an important distinction between using words and talking about words, between using words and mentioning words. The way that this is standardly described in the philosophical literature seems to me not just false, but it's, well, I don't want to use technical terms, okay, uh, I, but it's, it, 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 it's off the wall. Auf der Wand sounds better in German. Uh, and it, it, to say you can't, uh, the word Boston cannot occur in number two, only the proper name of the word occurs. Now Elizabeth Anscombe said, you know, that has a funny consequence. It has a consequence. You can't be told anybody's name. Because if you're told that guy's name is Smith, you didn't hear the name Smith. You only heard the name of the name. On the other hand, if you're told that guy is Smith, you're not told his name, you're just told who he is. Now, that's a kind of a, a, a fakey paradox that philosophers like, but it ought to tell us that there's something wrong. Now, oddly enough, one of the chief adherents of this view, without knowing it, discovered a reductio ad absurdum. Uh, but then what, what courageous philosophers do when they discover a reductio ad absurdum is they declare it to be a discovery. And the discovery is uh, that if you put in a free variable, uh, x has six letters, then you couldn't put quotes around uh, x. Or if you say, uh, take this, take a, uh, let me give you a better example. If you take a sentence, take Socrates is bald, and knock out the word Socrates and put in a free variable x, then if you wanted to consider this sentence, this, the, the variable now is no longer a free variable. Now it just occurs as part of a proper name. There's no structure, to, there's no syntactical structure to a proper name, so there's no syntactical structure here. So and I, if you don't understand that, don't worry. We'll get to it when I tell you about uh, 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 free variables and open sentences. So Quine said, well, you have to invent a new kind of quotes, and these are these corner quotes. To, uh, to deal with that kind of case where you want the variable to be able to function as a variable and not like the word cat in catastrophe. Uh, but what that tells you is you were making a mistake initially when you said that putting quotes around a word creates a new word, the proper name. You could invent a proper name of the word Boston, call it Bill. And then we could say this will be proposition four. Bill has four letters. Okay, now uh, this is an actual name of a word. I deliberately introduced Bill as the name of the word Boston. So both two and four are true, and four is true because the word named by the word Bill actually does have, oh, I'm sorry, I am screwed up here, six letters. Uh, has six letters because now Bill is the name of the word Boston, and Boston does have six letters. So you can see in number two that it's true that Boston has six letters. You can just count one, two, three, four, five, six. Whereas in four, you, you can't see on the blackboard that Bill has six letters. You have to know that Bill is the name of the word Boston. Anyway, we're going to talk about reference. And when we do, I want you to keep in mind that there's a distinction between using a word to refer, that's the use of the word, and talking about the word. And I think the terminology of use and mention is probably a good way to do that. But is the standard account is false. The standard account says when you put quotes around a word, you make a completely no word, a completely new word, the prop 
the proper name of the word you put quotes around. That seems to be a mistake, and it's led to a lot of other mistakes that we'll get to when we talk about how we use language to talk about language. Okay, all of that is just uh, clearing my throat to get to the main topic of this lecture, which is the introduction of the notion of the Speech Act. Um, now, uh, maybe I should take questions about what I said so far. Any, I mean, I'm repeating stuff last time. The only stuff I added this time was about use and mention. Uh, any, any questions about that? I mean, we're going to come back to reference. You're going to hear more about reference probably than you ever wanted to hear uh, because it is the central subject in the uh, philosophy of language. How do words refer? Okay. I, and my answer, by the way, is going to be they don't. Uh, speakers refer using words. Words don't refer. It's speakers. It's not the marks on the blackboard that refer, but it's the speakers using the words uh, that refer. But anyway, we're going to get to that. All right. Now, all of the stuff that I've said so far about uh, necessity and contingency and a priori and a posteriori and all that, seems to be about the use of language to state the truth. And you succeed in this use of language if what you say is true, and you fail if what you say is false. Now, Austin, who was a, a professor of philosophy in uh, Oxford, uh, as well as Wittgenstein, who was a famous uh, professor of philosophy uh, then in Cambridge, um, Austin and Wittgenstein, in their different ways, notice that there's something fishy about the idea that language is only used to make statements. It's only used to describe things. And a lot of people had argued that unless a proposition was either analytic or synthetic, and all synthetic propositions were empirical, uh, they would be meaningless. And so traditional branches of philosophy like ethics and aesthetics were declared uh, to be meaningless by a certain school of philosophers called logical positivists. I'll tell you about, uh, more about them later as well. But Austin looked at this and thought, there are a whole lot of utterances that don't set out to make true or false claims. A guy who says, the meeting is adjourned, or I now pronounce you husband and wife, or I order you to leave the room, or I promise to come and see you next week, or war is hereby declared. Such a person doesn't set out to describe a state of affairs. I think if the guy says uh, the meeting is adjourned, it won't make any sense to ask him, well, how do you know it's adjourned? What's the evidence that is adjourned? Because he wasn't making that kind of a claim. He wasn't claiming to describe a state of affairs when he says the meeting is adjourned. He was creating a state of affairs. He was performing an action rather than describing some phenomena. And Austin introduced the notion of a performative. And the idea of a performative is that there is a class of verbs, usually verbs, sometimes you get nouns, but it's usually verbs which are such that if you utter a sentence containing the verb and you do it in appropriate circumstances, then you will perform the act named by the verb. So you can declare war by saying, I declare war. If you're the appropriate authority, Congress has to do it for the United States, but Congress makes this collective speech act. They declare war. Uh, and you can pronounce, if you're the preacher, you can pronounce somebody husband and wife in the course of a marriage ceremony. And any speaker can make a promise uh, by saying, I promise. In all of those cases, you have a performative verb. And the use of the verb in appropriate circumstances will be the performance of the very act named by the verb. So Austin said we need to distinguish between performative utterances which don't set out to be true or false. It's not, they're not trying to be true or false. We need to distinguish them from what he called constative utterances. And these are cases where you're actually saying something that's true or false. And these would be such things as statements and descriptions. 
and this would be over here, this whole class of utterances where you, so to speak, create a speech phenomenon. You create an order or a command or an adjournment or a marriage or a declaration of war just by saying something, by making the appropriate utterance. So it looked like, uh, initially at least, that you could make a distinction uh, between the performative and the constative. What are the, what's the basis of the distinction? Well, Austin tried to get a precise distinction, and it's very interesting why it didn't work, because that led him to rethink uh, the whole nature of utterances. It looks like the way you make the distinction is this. On the one hand, you say, uh, constatives over here can be true or false, and over here they're not true or false, but somehow appropriate or authorized or correct, and Austin introduced the technical notion. He said these could be felicitous or infelicitous. So if I got up in the middle of the academic senate and shouted, the meeting is adjourned, well, that would be infelicitous because I'm not in a position to do that. So that's the first way of making the distinction. Performatives are not true or false, but felicitous or inf infelicitous. Constatives can be true or false. Uh, but then uh, it seems that for the performative, there's a special verb, a special sentence form. And over here, it's just any declarative sentence, it seems, can be used uh, to make a constative. And indeed, even sentences con per containing performative verbs can be used to make statements. So if I say, I promise to come and see you next Wednesday, that's a performative utterance because I'm making a promise. But if I say, I promise too many things to too many people, that's not making a promise, that's just making a statement about myself. I'm describing myself as performing a certain sort of action. So it looks we've got two kinds of <coughs> uh, ways of distinguishing. The performatives are not true or false, constatives are. Performatives require a special verb, uh, whereas the constatives don't. Uh, and Finally, it seems the basic underlying idea is that a performative is an action. It's a doing or acting as opposed to over here, it is a saying. You're just talking when you make the constative, but in the case of the performative, you are performing an action by doing the talking. You're adjourning the meeting, declaring war, making somebody husband and wife, giving and bequeathing, your watch, <coughs> etc. Okay, now it looks like a nice distinction, but if you look closely, Austin says you can't make it work because all of the features that are supposed to define the performative are also features of the constatives, and I'm going to go through that. It seems that in order to issue a performative utterance, such as the meeting is adjourned, or war is declared, I, or I, I name this battleship the battleship Potemkin, uh, it seems that in order to do that, I have to be in a special position. There has to be uh, some uh, conditions under which it's okay. But that's true for statements as well. Uh, you can't just say anything. Uh, you have, if it's to be a serious, uh, a correct utterance, you have to be in some kind of a position where it is appropriate. If I say, right now, there are 17 people in the next room. And you say to me, well, how do you know? What's your evidence? I, it won't do for me to say, it's a free country. And if I want to say there are exactly 17 people, okay, of course I can make these noises, but there's something wrong with my utterance. If I say, at this very instant, Barack Obama is combing his hair with his left hand. At this very instant. And you say, well, how do you know? What's your evidence? And I, free country. I can say anything I want. Well, of course, but there's something infelicitous about that statement. You're not in a position 
to say that. And that's just as infelicitous as you getting up in the meeting and saying the meeting is adjourned. Furthermore, there are lots of verbs for constatives. I, if you're very pompous, you don't have to say snow is white. You can say, I state that snow is white, or even I hereby state that snow is white. Um, and indeed, uh, there are various, varying degrees uh, which one has for making statements. And if you want it to be fully explicit, you could introduce one of these constative performative verbs like state or describe or characterize. How would you describe Sally? Oh God, don't ask me to describe Sally. Well, I would describe her as a marginal schizophrenic sufferer and then so on. You give a, a description or, and that sounds like a performative because you've used the describe there, the verb to name the very action that you were performing when you uttered it. So it looks like we, this doesn't work because the verbs that are supposed to be over here can also work over here. That is, you have special verbs for statements. But now, going back here, some constatives can be true or false. If I say, uh, I'm sorry, some perf performatives, some I, uh, performatives can be true or false. If I say, I warn you that the bull is about to charge, and it turns out the bull is a stuffed bull, uh, it's been dead for 17 years, uh, then my warning is false. I will have given a false warning. So it turns out, just as on this side, the constatives can be felicitous or infelicitous, uh, some performatives can be true or false. And just as there are special verbs for performatives, there can also be special verbs for constatives. Finally, that leads to the obvious point, namely, it is, you can't make the distinction by saying all performatives are actions, doings, and all constatives are sayings, statements, because all statements are also actions. It's you're doing something whenever you say anything. So this is characteristic of intellectual history that what was introduced as a kind of marginal case, as a kind of an oddball case, tends to swallow the general case because the features that seem to be special of performatives, that they could be felicitous or infelicitous, had a special verbs and were all actions, those three features are features of constatives as well. And you come up with the, with the result Every utterance is an action. Every utterance that you perform is a case of performing an action. And hence, we need to recast the investigation. We need to look at the study of language as the study of speech acts. When people talk, they are doing something. And our task as theorists is to describe the structure of the actions that they are performing. Uh, okay, and now that's going to be our next heading. For those of you who keep notes, uh, bless you all, the new heading is Speech Acts. Uh, and I'm now going to tell you some of Austin's investigations about that. Uh, later on, I'm going to make some uh, corrections to that. But let's take questions. I saw a hand up. Yeah. Okay, now, now she raises a deep question, and that is, all the same, doesn't it look like you have to have a special category of utterances that use these performative verbs, because you're changing reality when you use the performative verb. You're making it the case that the meeting is adjourned. I, and similarly, when you say, uh, I hereby state that it's raining, you're making it the case that you state. Uh, but the answer, I think Austin's answer to that would be, yeah, but you're changing reality when you say it's raining. You've made it the case that you made a statement. You just didn't say that you made a statement, but all the same, you did make a statement. Now, that's a, that, this is one of the deep questions we're going to be examining in this course. What is the relation between language and reality? Every utterance changes reality in this respect 
something now exists that didn't exist before, namely that utterance. But of course, that's true of all actions. If I raise my arm, then I have changed reality because something that existed exists now that didn't exist before, namely the raising of my arm. The question, though, that Austin was confronted with is, can we make a clear distinction between the constative class of speech acts and the performative class of speech acts? And we can't on the way that he originally tried to with these distinctions. Now, I think implicit in what you said is a variation which uh, we can make, and that is we can say, all the same, there is a special class of performative utterances. Indeed, we need to identify three features. There's the performative verb, there's the performative sentence, and there's the performative utterance. And we use the verbs in the sentences to make the utterances. And the definition of the performative utterance is it's an utterance which contains a verb, or sometimes a noun, but basically they're verbs, contains a verb which is such that in the utterance of the sentence you perform the act named by the verb. So if you say, I order you to leave the room, war is hereby declared, I give and bequeath my watch uh, to my nephew, all of those are cases where you have a verb or verb phrase which is such that in the appropriate sentence under the appropriate circumstances, the performative utterance is a performance of an act named by that verb. Uh, okay, so it looks like you're still going to need a distinction between those sentences, verbs, uh, and utterances that have this feature and those that don't. It's just that you can't make that distinction in terms of the true-false distinction on which it was originally based. Okay, yes? Yeah, um, what are the examples that you used when you were talking about constative uh, sentences or statements? You, were ta you used the example of the bull. You yeah. Said, well, I'm warning you that a bull's coming. Yeah. It turns out it's false. Yeah. But it seems something, something striking about that that's kind of funny because it does seem like, I guess, a performance. Like, I'm warning you. Yeah. But then you could say, well, it's true or false whether there actually is a bull coming yeah. or not. The, the point is this, I mean, I, I, in case you didn't hear the uh, question at the back, I'll repeat it. Uh, there does seem to be a distinction because it's true that the warning might be false, but all the same, it's true that you did warn the guy, right? I mean, there was a warning even though the warning was false. And Austin would agree to that. Austin would say, yes, you did make a warning, but the whole idea was supposed to be that performatives couldn't be true or false, and this one can. It's clearly a performative because it's got all these indices. You, you performed an act by naming it. But you performed an act by saying, I warn you. And it meets the other tests. One of the tests he used was this hereby test. Can you stick in the word hereby? And you can. You can say, I hereby warn you that the bull is about to charge. But in that, in that case, then, you've got, you definitely perform the act of warning, and that was a performative, but all the same, the resulting utterance, the resulting warning, can be true or false. And that's the point that he was making. Now, at the same time that Austin was doing all this stuff, uh, Wittgenstein was challenging the idea that language only serves one purpose to describe. And Wittgenstein thought we ought to recognize a whole lot of different functions of language. And indeed, Wittgenstein says I, that there are, strictly speaking, an indefinite number, a countless number of uses of language. Now, I often read in intellectual histories how much Austin was influenced by Wittgenstein. That is absolutely false. I knew Austin very well, and he was totally colorblind where Wittgenstein was uh, concerned. I used to try to get him to argue about Wittgenstein, and he, he was a very intelligent man, but mostly what he said about Wittgenstein uh, wasn't all that smart. Uh, and they were, well, he was totally unsympathetic. Wittgenstein was a kind of a mystical, middle, central European uh, who, who was full of, of a deep and profound and often mystical ideas. 
Austin was exactly the opposite. <laughs> a very precise middle uh, English middle class professor who insisted on precision. So when Wittgenstein says there are an infinite number of uses of language, well, Austin used to say, there are philosophers who say that there are an infinite number of uses of language, and then they give a list of 17 <laughs> or 32. And Austin would say this with you know, unspeakable contempt. I mean, oh my God, uh, how could anybody? Uh, Austin once said to me about Oxford, there's a lot of loose thinking going on in this town. <laughs> And I remember we shook our heads and we thought all the way out the Ifley Road and the Woodstock Road and the Banbury Road, maybe all the way to Banbury itself, loose thinking. <laughs> uh, and Austin was against all forms of loose thinking. However, that made it impossible for him to understand uh, a lot of things in Wittgenstein. So at one time when I was an undergraduate, I insisted on our little informal discussion group that we discuss Wittgenstein's private language argument. And Austin found it very uncomfortable, but his technique was to take everything dead literally. Uh, so he said, okay, next week everybody has to bring a box with a beetle in it, because Wittgenstein has a famous example of the beetle in the box. And then, uh, well, he was being sarcastic. We didn't bring a box with a beetle in it. But at one point, Wittgenstein says, Maybe there's nothing at all in the box. And Austin shook his head and said, a plain contradiction. First he says there's a beetle in the box, and now he says there's nothing in the box. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I'm always amused when I read how much Austin was influenced by Wittgenstein. He was not. Now, Moore, that was somebody else. Uh, and in fact, I think maybe the most insensitive remark ever made about Wittgenstein was Austin once said, it's all in Moore. It's not all in Moore, it's quite different. But in any case, I just want you to see, uh, this was Austin's most important idea, was that all utterances are the performance of speech acts. Okay, so let's uh, probe that idea. Let's see how far we can get with that. Any more questions? I want everybody up with us now. Uh, those are both good questions, yes. Yeah. And then uh, you didn't know that there was a bull, but there happened to be a bull around. Yeah. Would that change anything? Well, here's an interesting uh, question, and that is the question, how about cases where you get it right by accident, so to speak? Uh, so, for example, a standard case of a lie is a case where you say something you don't believe. But how about the lie, which unknowns to, unknown to you, turns out to be true, you see. Now, in that case, did you lie or not? It's like your case, did you uh, make a true statement or not? Uh, there's a famous uh, short story by Sartre. It's called Le Mur, the Wall. And I forget the name of the characters, but one of them is captured by the fascists. And his name, we call him Pierre. And they say to Pierre, where is Henri? And Pierre lies. He says, Henri is hiding out in the cemetery. Well, unknown to Pierre, Henri really is hiding out in the cemetery. So the fascist police go to the cemetery, and they find Henri, and they let Pierre go. Now, did Pierre lie? Uh, this is supposed to have some deep um, uh, existential meaning. I, I'm not interested in that. I don't understand that part. But uh, there is an interesting question here, and that is, did Pierre lie? And I would say he did. Lying consists in saying something you don't believe. If it turns out that it's true, in spite of your efforts to say a falsehood, all the same, you did lie. On the other hand, the guy who made a statement uh, where he was totally mistaken, uh, was having a fantasy, but it turned out uh, that it's true. He did say something true, even though his uh, statement was in Philistus. If I say, I, I, uh, there is a cat in this drawer, I say that just to be saying something, just stupidly, and I open up and there is a cat in the drawer, then I did say something true, but it was just a coincidence, just by accident. Those things happen. Yes? Yeah. And making a well, uh, there are cases of people who say things under the influence of mind altering. I've never had one of these, unless, <laughs> unless beer and wine count. 
Uh, I, I, and they do say strange things. I, there's no question about it. The most famous case is William James. William James was a famous American philosopher and psychologist, maybe, well, I was going to say the best American philosopher ever, but I, no, the third best uh, American philosopher ever. The second was, yeah, maybe he's the fourth best. I was going to make Peirce the second best, and, and John Dewey the third, and William James the fourth. I'm keeping first place open. Okay, we'll keep first place <laughs> open. Um, uh, but in any case, here's uh, um, <laughs> William James uh, had this practice of testing all of these mind-bending substances to see if he would get some mystical insight. Uh, and he would take these drugs. He took a drug that uh, uh, knocked him into a trance, and he would have a secretary there to record what he said. And he came out of the trance, of having been in this drug-induced trance, and he asked the secretary, what did I say? What did I say? And the secretary read aloud, you said, Hagamus, hogamus, woman is monogamous. <laughs> hogamus, hagamus, man is polygamous. Uh, anyway, okay, so that's, all, all right, that's the effort. Now we're going to go back to work. Anyway, this is... Uh, uh, these are <clears throat> interesting points. All right, now then, let's suppose then that we take the Speech Act as our target of investigation, as I think we should. Well, it seems clear that we need to distinguish different kinds of Speech Acts, and I make some distinctions that are not quite the same as Austin's, but I'll tell you mine, and then we'll see how they compare to Austin's. It seems to me you have to distinguish uh, the sheer fact of uttering a sentence, uh, and I'll call that the utterance act, where it's just a case of uttering a sentence or a word. But now, typically, when you utter a sentence, you're saying something. If I say it's raining, I will have made a statement that it's raining, and Austin I introduced a technical term uh, for this, this type of complete speech act. He called these illocutionary acts. And I want to say that every successful utterance contains one or more illocutionary acts. So if I say it's raining, I, I, the meeting is adjourned, um, I wish it would uh, rain more often in Berkeley. All of those utterances are illocutionary acts. And this is the act of uttering a sentence or etc. Sometimes you don't get a whole sentence, but th that's the, the standard case. But now Austin pointed out you also need the act of achieving a certain effects on people. So by saying something, I might convince you or persuade you and Austin, he was good at inventing these uh, terms. He called that a perlocutionary act. And the perlocutionary act is the act of achieving a certain effect on the hearer. If I convince you, persuade you, annoy you, exasperate you, uh, all of those are cases of perlocutionary acts. Whereas if I make a statement, ask a question, give an order, make a promise, all of those are cases of illocutionary acts. Notice that typical for illocutionary acts, there will be a performative verb. Uh, I hereby state that it's raining. I hereby order you to leave the room. Uh, there is no performative for the perlocutionary act. Uh, you can't say, you can say, Bill, uh, I'm telling you that Sally didn't do it. Sally's innocent, but you can't use the per perlocutionary, you can't say, Bill, I convince you that Sally is innocent, or Bill, I persuade you. You can say, I'm telling you, I say, I'm trying to uh, persuade you, but there is no performative use of the perlocutionary verbs. So you can, you can in fact, convince you uh, by telling, uh, you can convince people by telling them something, but you cannot use the performative, you cannot use the verb convince in a performative form. You can't say, I hereby convince you that it's raining. I hereby persuade you, amuse you, exasperate you, annoy you. 
All of those have to do with further effects on the hearer. Uh, now, it's interesting which verbs will take a performative and which won't. Uh, so, for example, there's some verbs that don't take a performative occurrence uh, because they imply concealment and the uh, illocution, the performative always makes explicit what you're saying. So you can um, uh, tell somebody uh, that they got dirt on their face by saying, uh, I, you got dirt on your face, or I'm telling you, you got dirt on your face. Those are performative. But you can't say, look, I hint that you've got dirt on your face, or I insinuate that your pants are unbuttoned, uh, because that's not hinting and insinuating. Does everybody see this point? You cannot use hint and insinuate performatively. I hereby insinuate uh, that your wife is unfaithful to you, or I hereby uh, hint uh, that you got mud all over your face, because that's not a case of hinting or insinuating. Now, English is odd, because there are these odd uses of verbs. Um, as far as I know, there's no way that you can say, use the word uh, lurk uh, in the first person uh, present without modifying it. Well, what are you guys doing over there? Oh, we're just lurking. Uh, or if I say to you, let's go lurk behind the, the counter here. And I think skulk is probably the same. Oh, let's do some skulking this afternoon. <laughs> Sounds funny to me. Uh, so I don't know why you can't do it with lurk and skulk, but I'm pretty clear that you can't do it with hint and insinuate because that implies uh, absence. Uh, that implies, uh, the, the performative verb implies explicitness where hinting and insinuating Im imply concealment. If it's, you make it fully explicit, it's no longer a case of hinting. Now, Austin was struck by insult, uh, that you can't insult somebody by saying, I hereby insult you. And he looked at old dueling practices and found that there were conventional ways of insulting people, throwing your gloves at their feet. That's a speech act. That's a type of illocutionary act. But you can't insult somebody by saying, I hereby insult you. And Austin was puzzled by that. But I think it's because insult is perlocutionary. It's got partly perlocutionary meaning to it. And you can see this if people will say things like, and in, a, in an argument when somebody's being insulting, you might say, look, you can't insult me. Meaning, I don't take you seriously enough for allow, to allow you to achieve this perlocutionary effect. So I think hint and insinuate do not have a performative use because they're inexplicit. But insult seems to me to lack a performative use for a different reason. Namely, I think insulting is partly perlocutionary. OK, so far, so good. Now it seems to me we need to introduce a crucial distinction, which is going to make our investigation a lot easier. If you look at sets of utterances, like, for example, um, if you consider uh, cases uh, like the, the contrast between you will leave the room, said as a prediction, Will you leave the room, said as a question, and leave the room, said as an order, it seems to me clearly there's something in common between those cases. In every case, the idea that you leave the room is expressed, and I'm going to introduce a very tricky notion here, the notion of a proposition. And I'm going to say, the proposition that you will leave the room is expressed in all three illocutionary acts. The prediction, you will leave the room. The question, will you leave the room? And the order, leave the room, or the requ request, please leave the room. All of those contain the same proposition, the proposition that you will leave the room, but they contain it with different illocutionary forces. So the basic structure of the illocutionary act seems to me to be this. You have a propositional content. We can represent that with a P. And then that propositional content is presented with different forces. 
with the force of a statement, the force of a question, the force of an order. And now, if that's right, then it seems to me we're going to need another notion, and that is the notion of a propositional act. And a propositional act is not a complete speech act by itself, but it's the act of expressing the proposition which will occur as part of a complete illocutionary act. So the proposition that you will leave the room is expressed in the three different illocutionary acts. Please leave the room. Will you leave the room? You will leave the room, even though in each case you have a different total illocutionary act. Notice that the propositional act is an abstraction. It's not something that can occur by itself. But why do we need it then? We need it to mark what is in common to the three different illocutionary acts, as well as what is different between uh, cases uh, where you have the same type of illocutionary act, but different propositional contents. So I order you to leave the room and don't come back contains two illocutionary acts, the order to leave the room and the order to not come back. Both of those are orders, but the propositional content is different in the two cases. So you need a distinction between this F part, the force, and the P part, the propositional content, because the same proposition can occur in different Fs. That was our example of please leave the room, will you leave the room, leave the room. But uh, you also need uh, the notion uh, of the uh, same F occurring with different propositional contents as when you can order somebody to leave the room and order them to not come back. So because the two features are discriminable, you need a distinction between the illocutionary force which marks the type of speech acts that you are performing, the type of act that's being performed, and the content of that act, the propositional content. Okay, so I introduce the notion then of the propositional act in addition to the illocutionary act and the perlocutionary act where the propositional act is always an abstraction from the total illocutionary act. Now all of that is uh, uh, going to be crucial for our investigation of language. Notice that the old time behaviorists who thought we could analyze language just by looking at the stimulus responses, looking at the effects on people of, our, of uh, utterances. In effect, you can't do that because what you get then are perlocutionary acts. You look at the effects that utterances have. And the idea that the behaviors had was that you could find out the meanings of words and sentences by looking at what sorts of behavior, uh, what sort of stimulus would prompt the utterance and what sorts of effects the utterance would have. It was a hopeless enterprise from the beginning. Uh, if you uh, uh, get your uh, freshman in the psychology course and try to find out uh, what effect on them an utterance uh, uh, has, you'll find pretty much not any effect. They might look puzzled. I mean, what's common to all occurrences of the word shirt in I'm wearing a new shirt or shirts are cheap nowadays because they're all made in the same town in China, or the Roman Empire contained no shirts. Now I looked closely and I didn't see any common uh, behavioral response to all those occurrences of the word shirt. So it it's was a fairly hopeless enterprise to try to do a behaviorist account of language. And one of the many things wrong with it is it can't distinguish between the illocutionary and the perlocutionary. There's several other things I want you to notice. The illocutionary is always intentional. You don't make a statement or issue a promise unless you intend to make a statement or issue a promise. But the perlocutionary can be completely unintentional. You might annoy people or exasperate them or convince them or persuade them without intending to. I, 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 I might convince you that I'm drunk just by behaving in a drunken fashion, but it might not be my intention to convince you that I'm drunk. Whereas if I make a statement, it must be the case that I intend to make a statement. Now it's interesting how we will hold people responsible, even in cases where they didn't intend 
to perform the act because the social situation is such that you, you're not supposed to allow it. You're not to, to give the impression that you're performing a speech act if you aren't. So if you left your left turn signal on and somebody smashes the right side of your car, uh, he will be able to argue in court, look, he was signaling a left turn. And you can argue, well, I didn't really signal a left turn because I didn't intend to. Well, you won't get away with it because the law in a case like that requires that you not give the impression that you're signaling a left turn by turning your left uh, turn signal on. Uh, so we'll hold you responsible performing for performing the speech act even in cases where you didn't intend to. The trickier case is the auction. If you've ever been to auctions, it can be very tense in the auction, and you don't want to give the impression you're making a bid if you're not making the bid. I once attended an auction uh, in London at uh, Sotheby's, and a wonderful Japanese um, a print uh, came up for auction, and the bidding went very fast, and it soon reached a thousand pounds. And the woman that I was with saw a picture she admired on the other side of the room, and she said, look at that picture. The auctioneer turned to us and said, uh, that lady has just bid 1,100 pounds. And I thought, oh my God, I don't have 1,100 pounds. Uh, anyway, fortunately, the bidding went on. Uh, that we were not held responsible. But if you give the impression that you're bidding at an auction, then you will be held responsible for bidding. And bidding, of course, is a type of speech act. Uh, well, I'll tell you the kind that it is later. Uh, oh, by the way, now I wish I'd bought the damn picture. Uh, it was Hokusai's The Wave, and it went, I, of course, I didn't have the money then. I was a graduate student, but in any case, uh, it's worth lots more money than, than it went for in that remote era. Okay, now there's some tricky parts uh, to this. Uh, one is, I say there's a whole proposition, but in the case of questions, only in yes-no questions do you get a whole proposition. Uh, so will you leave the room, said as a question, just gives the proposition, will you leave the room, and then you're asked to say yes or no. But if I say to you, how many people were at the party, uh, then the way that that works is the question let this be our force indicator for questions, then it's not question P where you get a whole proposition. It's more like this. Question X number of people were there. And what you're requested to do in the case of the question is to fill in the value of X. Uh, what you're supposed to do is complete the proposition. So in the case of all questions except yes, no questions, you don't get an entire proposition, you get a proposition with a hole in it and you're supposed to fill the hole. Uh, why were you so rude to Sally means fill in the blank in the proposition. I was rude to Sally because, and then you're supposed to give uh, the reason why. So in those cases, you don't get an entire uh, proposition. Now, there's odd features of all these, and I want you to think about. One is, in general, the form of the question determines the form of the answer. So if, uh, if the question is, how many people were, an, uh, were at the party, it won't do to say, uh, because she was rude to me. That's an answer uh, to another uh, question, but you have to use the form of the question. How many people were at the party determines the form of the answer. Uh, there were X number of people at the party where you have to fill in. And again, English is amazing because there are odd uh, features of English where that's n um, not true. And shall and will, the damn modal auxiliary verbs, uh, always run against the rules here. If I say to you, Shall I marry Sally? Uh, the answer is not yes you shall or no you shall not, not or even yes you will or no you will not. 
the question asks for an imperative. It asks for advice. Uh, shall I uh, marry Sally invites yes, do marry her, or no, don't marry her. But it doesn't ask that the shall form there does not require that shall or some, other, some variant like will occurs in the answer. Now, why that should be, I don't know. Uh, the modal auxiliary verbs uh, that I, uh, uh, can and could, ought and should, may and must, uh, will, all of those are very mysterious. And, and Chomsky once told me he didn't work on those because they were too hard. Uh, and the, there's an odd fact that the people I know who do work on modal auxiliary verbs, uh, the people who really devote their lives to them, tend to go crazy. Uh, and I don't, I'm not recommending that any of you should do it, but if you get the modal auxiliaries figured out, uh, it might be helpful. I, there was a guy, a wonderful man in our English department who was very good on these, and he used to come to my office. And after one session, the woman came from the next door office and said, what was all that screaming going on in your office? And I said, that was Julian talking about may and might. Wait till he gets on the can and could. Those are really tough verbs. Anyway, OK, so what we've got then is a kind of nice picture that what we're interested in, where human linguistic communication is concerned, is the illocutionary act. <laughs> But the illocutionary act is typically performed in the course of uttering a sentence, and that's an utterance act. And for most illocutionary acts, when you perform the illocutionary act, you express a proposition. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you just get a, a, a noun phrase. Hurrah for the 49ers uh, just gives you something of this form. Uh, where you have the illocutionary force, F, and then you just have a name, the 49ers. And indeed, sometimes people just uh, perform an illocutionary act with no propositional content at all. Hurrah, or damn, uh, or I won't go through the various obscenities, uh, but there, uh, I, you sometimes know what they're talking about when they say, oh, and then they uh, utter some unfortunate expression. I'm not drunk enough to uh, go through the list uh, this morning. But in any case, uh, you can fill in your own values uh, there. But in any case, the, the kind of stuff that we'll be studying, the, the stuff that's really interesting to us, are where you get a proposition or a big chunk of a proposition, as in interrogatives, as in questions. Now, of course, that's the simple picture, and now we're going to find these wonderful complexities. You can perform a very large number of speech acts with just one utterance by performing indirect speech acts. So you say one thing, and you mean what you say, but you also mean something else. Uh, it frequently happens at faculty uh, parties uh, that it gets quite late in the evening, uh, and the wife says to the husband, it's quite late. And he said, no, it's not late at all. It's only 2 o'clock. Uh, and she says, no, dear, it's quite late. And it's clear she means, one, it's quite late. Two, time to go. And that is a directive. Three, and that's, uh, she, uh, she's um, uh, uh, imposing... Uh, uh, an obligation on him, but also she's performing an undertaking because she's saying not only is it late and time to go, but there's an element of threat. Wait till I get you home. Uh, so you have all of these speech acts contained in one speech act. You can perform, you can utter a single sentence that contains a very large number of implications that implies other speech acts. And if you look in, if you listen in ordinary conversation, I think you'll find that a high percentage of uh, utterances that you hear in ordinary conversations are indirect speech acts, um, where people say one thing, but they mean something much more. Let's go to the movies tonight, is answered uh, often by saying, no, I have to work on my homework, whereas you understand I have to work on my homework as an answer to the suggestion, let's go to the movies, because it's a reason for not complying with a suggestion. 
Okay, so we're going to investigate the structure of the Illocutionary Act, but before we do that, there are two crucial notions I have to introduce, and those are the notions of the network and the background. If you understand any sentence, you have to understand a whole lot of stuff that is not contained in the literal meaning of the sentence. I say, how did you get to the campus today? And you say, we drove. Uh, that might seem the simplest conversation imaginable, but to understand that conversation, you need a prodigious amount of information. It doesn't mean uh, we drove a team of six white horses. Uh, normally, you would take it to mean we drove in a car. I, and think of what you have to understand in order what it means to say we drove in a car, even if you said it explicitly. You have to understand that a car is a means of transportation, uh, that it proceeds along the surface of the earth, uh, that you people get inside a car rather than uh, strapping themselves to the tire or riding on top of the roof. Uh, and all of that is contained no, uh, rather, all of that is presupposed by your understanding of the sentence we drove, drove, but none of it is contained in the literal meaning of the sentence. There's nothing in the literal meaning of the sentence to block the understanding. Even if you made it explicit, we drove in Sally's car, which is a, a 1997 Subaru. Uh, even if you put all of that, there's nothing to block the various kinds of misunderstandings. And the way you, we drove is, first of all, we broke the car into bits and each of us ate their bit, and then we ran to the campus and coughed up the various bits. No, that's not the standard meaning of driving in a Subaru. And you don't have to have that made explicit. It's all a part of the network of information that you have. You understand any sentence, so I'm arguing, only given a certain amount of other information. That's what I call a network. But furthermore, there are a whole series of abilities you have, abilities to move about, abilities to cope with cars and other people, abilities to understand movement through space and time. And I call that uh, the background. So you understand the sentence, we drove, or we drove in Sally's Subaru. You understand those sentences only in virtue of having a network of other mental states as well as a background of capacities and dispositions and ways of coping. All meaning and understanding presuppose a network and a background. Pick up any newspaper, take a sentence at random, and ask yourself, what sort of information do you have to have to understand that sentence? What sort of abilities do you have to have? Uh, and by the way, this is not innocent, because often uh, they will uh, give you, uh, in the newspapers and, and speeches and so on, you will hear sentences where it's assumed you understand the sentence, where it's pretty clear they haven't the faintest idea what they're talking about. Uh, in the great economic crisis that we're still going through, uh, certain kinds of metaphors are constantly coming up and they're very poorly explained. There was a period when people talked um, blithely about something called toxic assets. Do you remember toxic assets? Well, I never knew anybody who got a sore stomach from mortgages. I mean, in what sense exactly? were these toxic, and we're told that the financial system is freezing up. Well, it's been pretty hot in this summer. What's the form of the freezing? And I think expressions like toxic assets and freezing up are really uh, designed to prevent people from having to go through the struggle of actually explaining. Uh, these are not innocent expressions because, of course, conventional economic theory I mean, the standard market, uh, free market mantras make it impossible that there should be such a thing as a toxic asset over any period of time because the market has perfect information. The information would eliminate toxicity, to keep going with the metaphor. All right, so you understand the sentence only against a background and within a network. Uh, but that doesn't mean uh, that everything works fine because there's a lot of confusion 
even within the network and the background. Now, if you're not convinced by that, you see a lot of people think, no, sense just has the meaning it has. The simplest way to convince you is to see that the same word with the same meaning can have different applications, can determine different conditions of satisfaction relative to different networks and backgrounds. By the way, I, I spent a long time trying to make a precise distinction between the network and the background, but I can't do it. I mean, there isn't a precise distinction for reasons I'll explain later on. But the, but the basic idea is the network is a set of things you might actually be thinking about. It's a set of uh, beliefs and desires and other meanings that you understand. And the background is a set of abilities that you have, ways that you have of coping uh, with the environment and with other people. Uh, the background is the biological and social skills that you bring to bear. Uh, the network is the set of thoughts uh, that you have, whether consciously or unconsciously. Now, the simplest way that I know to get people to see this is to see that the same word will be understood differently given different network and background assumptions. So if I take the word cut in Sally cut the cake and Bill cut the grass and the barber barber cut my hair uh, and let's say the tailor cut the cloth. Uh, all of those, I want to say, contain the same word, cut, and in some sense it has the same literal meaning. And you can see that if you contrast this with other sorts of occurrences. Um, if I say uh, the Raiders cut the roster, or uh, the president cut the salaries of the professors, that is a different, those are different meanings of the word cut. I'll get this up higher so you can see it. In, can everybody see that? In uh, the last two, uh, the word cut is used metaphorically and not literally. And there's a simple test that the linguists use. It's called conjunction reduction. If I say General Electric has invented a new devices, it can cut cake, it can cut grass, it can cut hair, and it can cut cloth, you can get rid of all of those different occurrences and just say it can cut hair, grass, uh, cake, and cloth. But you can't add, oh, and by the way, it can cut rosters and cut salaries. Uh, that would be a bad joke. Uh, so you'd conjunction reduction, you get rid of the conjunctions. Uh, uh, you don't have to keep repairing, uh, repeating the word cut. All the same, you understand it differently in those first four cases. And you see this if in case of the imperatives. I, if uh, I ask you uh, to cut the cake and you slice it with a knife, and then I ask you to cut the grass and you run out and stab it with a knife, you won't have done what I asked you to do. And if I say, Bill, now that you've cut the grass, cut the cake, and Bill promptly drags in the lawnmower and runs over the cake with it, he will not have done what I literally asked him. Now, why not? I mean, what's the matter? Didn't he cut in both cases? Yes, he did. But, and this is the key point, you understand any word against a background of ways of doing things, social practices that people have, and within a network of assumptions, within a network of other intentional states and other meanings that you're aware of. And I think the simplest way to see that point is to see that just about, I think, literally any sentence will admit of different interpretations given different background assumptions, different background uh, practices, and within different networks of beliefs. It's because we have a set of practices 
of cutting uh, cake and grass and hair and cloth uh, that we understand uh, the words the way we do. The, the semantic content of the word itself is not sufficient to fix its application, what I will later call the truth conditions or the conditions of satisfaction. You have to be part of a culture. You have to have a, 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 an apparatus that goes beyond just uh, literal meanings. Uh, okay, well, again, another way to see this is, I think, in the understanding of metaphors. Uh, if you take those uh, first four sentences, they translate pretty much exactly into other languages uh, that I know. In French, I, if you're going to say, for example, I cut my skin, you have to use a reflexive. Je me suis coupé le, le peau. And the English doesn't use the reflexive. You just say, I cut my skin. You wouldn't say, I cut myself my skin. Uh, you could say, I cut myself. But if you had a direct object there, you wouldn't have to use the reflexive. Uh, but these uh, metaphors, uh, um, if I say in English, Sally cut two classes last week. Uh, that doesn't translate in the French. Sally a coupé deux classes. And the French have, a, as typical of them, as they have a nutty metaphor for this. They say she, well, maybe it's not so bad. They say she dried out two classes. Elle a, elle a séché. Now, I may be out of date, but that's w what I remember. And, and French, uh, francophone among you can correct me on this. So metaphors, it's interesting which metaphors translate and which don't. Uh, metaphors are readily understood. Uh, dreadful examples of toxic assets and frozen financial systems are readily understood, but they don't all translate into other languages. Okay, the point I'm making now, oh my gosh, look at the time. Oh, I'm just getting started. Well, anyhow, okay, the point I'm making now is you understand any sentence within an enormous amount of intellectual apparatus, within a network of other uh, meanings and other intentional states and against the background of capacities. Now our first question is going to be how are illocutionary acts possible? And here is the, and in philosophy you've got to allow yourself to be absolutely flabbergasted by what any sane person takes for granted. Now any sane person takes it for granted that we talk to each other but I want you to be amazed by the fact that I can open this hole in my face and make this racket, make this acoustic blast that comes out for an hour and a half and all these remarkable things occur. I make statements, give descriptions, give explanations, all of those are illocutionary, but I convince people, annoy people, amuse people, bore people, exasperate people, and sometimes even put people to sleep. All of those are perlocutionary verbs, and how is it that just by making these noises through my mouth I can do that? The first crucial way of answering that question, how is it that you get from the physics to the semantics? How do you get from the acoustic blast to the speech act? The first way of asking that question is, what is meaning? I just, you know, there are certain words that are so awful that most of English language philosophy is about them. And two such words are mind and meaning. Notice they do not translate well into other languages. Um, they, they, uh, the, the French and the German for mind comes out roughly as spirit, esprit, or geist. And whenever I write a book called uh, Mind, or with mind in the title, the translators scratch their heads or they scratch their geist and wonder how the hell do we translate this because it looks like you're writing about the philosophy of spirit. It looks like it's all spiritual stuff. Anyway, meaning and mind, and on Thursday we're going to talk about meaning.